Robert Davi is one of the film industry's most recognized tough guys. Good guy or villain? License to Kill is one of our top Bond movies, and a big reason for that is Robert Davi, who plays the villain, Franz Sanchez. And today, we are thrilled to welcome Robert Davi to our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. First of all, Tom and I would like to thank you big time for coming on the show, because you are the best Bond villain, and we're thrilled to speak with you, Robert. Well, thank you so much, and uh, your site's terrific. I've listened to some of your interviews, and uh, you guys are spreading the word of Bond and spy movies, so it's great being here with you. Thanks again. Appreciate it. So playing Franz Sanchez in License to Kill, I mean, you are the perfect villain with a blend of charisma, viciousness, loyalty, honor among thieves, believability, and realness like no other James Bond villain. So... Let's get into Franz Sanchez a little bit here and then talk about some of the other things you did and what you're up to today with your fabulous singing career and all of that. All right. Absolutely. Be fun. Great. The part of Franz Sanchez, we love that part, but how did you get it? How did that actually happen for you? Okay. So you want stories and you want uh, some insider information. I may have told this story before, but there was a place in California in Beverly Hills called Cafe Roma. And in that little piazza, we all used to meet. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger here was my friend, and I took them here, there, and Mickey Rourke. We took, we would, and Sylvester Stallone, and people would just hang out there. It was a great hangout in the eighties. Uh, still is, uh, although I no longer live in California. There was a hair salon called Giuseppe Franco, friend of all of ours, uh, great character. Uh, he still has his salon there, as there is another one called Umberto in Beverly Hills. These are great guys. But Giuseppe Franco was doing the hair of a girl named Tina Broccoli. And uh, she would go into this uh, piazza every now and then, Cafe Roma. And I uh, ran into her, met her. She was a huge Goonie fan. Yeah. She says, oh, I love Goonies. And uh, we were talking, and she knew that I was born in Astoria, Queens, where her father was, Cubby, was born in Astoria, Queens, and grew up on Long Island. She goes... You've got to meet my dad. He would love you. And uh, so she arranged for a dinner with me and Cubby and his wife, Dana, at the Bistro Gardens, which is now, I think, Spago. But back then it was the Bistro Garden. And I met the legendary Cubby Broccoli. And we immediately hit it off very warmly because both born in Astoria, Queens, and then grew up on Long Island, Sag Harbor and, and uh, Deer Park and stuff. So we had a camaraderie right away. Also, me doing my first film with Frank Sinatra, who was a good friend of Cubby Broccoli's. And she said, you'd make a great Bond villain. I said, oh, thank you. And this is a couple of years passed by. And I'm supposed to do, Sly had asked me to do Rambo 3. I was supposed to do Rambo 2, but Goonies came along and I couldn't do both films. And I studied to be this Afghan rebel leader for, uh, for Rambo 3. And uh, it didn't happen uh, for whatever reasons. But I was prepared with this accent. And there was a gentleman named George England who was a legendary filmmaker, producer, best friends with Marlon Brando, wrote a book about Brando, ran his company, ran Paul Newman's company. Very intelligent man, married to Cloris Leachman at uh, one time. They were divorced then. And George was doing a, a project called Terrorist on Trial, the United States of America versus Salim Ajami. And because I was prepared to play this Afghan rebel leader, I had an accent down and I had uh, some intensity with it. And I went in to audition for this part of a Palestinian kidnapped by the United States government to stand trial for acts of terrorism. This was 1988. Now, this was written by Levinson Link, who were the creators of uh, Columbo and mm -hmm. Murder, She Wrote. Uh, they were the, the writing team that everyone spawned from in the, in the future. And uh, this was the last piece they did together because Dick Levinson passed away, but Bill Link was still alive. George produced this very forward piece which was a courtroom drama. Sam Waterston played the prosecutor and Ron Liebman played the uh, defense attorney fashioned off of an Alan Dershowitz kind of character. I did this piece, it, it, it aired on CBS, a three hour special and it had gotten tremendous reviews. Uh, cover the New York Times, uh, Entertainment and uh, LA Times and Herald Examiner that was around at the time. Anyway, a lot of noise it made. and. From what it goes is uh, Richard Maybaum, who had written all the bonds till that time, yeah. was watching this and he called up Cubby Broccoli and he said to Cubby, put on Channel 2 right away. 
And Cubby says, I've got it on. He goes, that's the next Bond villain. Do you see him? <laughs> and Cubby goes, I think so too. And Cubby had tuned in because of me, of course, and because of the reviews they heard about. Well, Cubby and Michael Wilson and John Glenn, they called me that week. I think it was the next day. This aired on a Sunday. On a Monday, I get a phone call. And they want to meet you. And I go in, I meet with Cubby and I meet with Michael Wilson. And they say, we'd like you to be the next Bond villain. Now, it hadn't totally been written yet. But they knew uh, they wanted me to be the next Bond villain. Great. Nice. And um, I had done Die Hard uh, just, you know, right after that, I think it was. Anyway, they over the time period, there were these other parts fashioned, other actors Everybody wanted to be a Bond villain. As you know, the whole town is open. The world is open for a Bond villain. Right. So every agency, every big agency, everybody jockeying for that position. But Cubby stayed fast. And I believe he and Sinatra were having a conversation one time. And uh, supposedly Sinatra said, or Cubby said, I'm going to give it to the Italian kid, <laughs> meaning me, uh, when they, they were all now... It's funny because Fran Sanchez is the uh, an acronym of, in a way, for Frank Sinatra because he was, you know, uh, there was a, I've told that before. Yeah. So I go in and now I have to meet with Timothy and John Glenn. And we hit it off famously, Timothy and I, I went back to Casino Real and we talked about that and the essence of Bond and the villain being mirror images of each other, as Ian Fleming describes yeah. in yes. the book. Mm hmm. And that was the approach, the real approach. And uh, Michael Wilson, uh, who was involved with the writing at the time with Richard Maybaum, had given me, uh, uh, told me to read a book called The Underground Empire, okay. which was about the drug trade. This is back, don't forget, then, because Bond is always ahead of itself yeah. in terms of a lot of, a lot of uh, world affairs and how yeah. dangerous the drug uh, uh, things were. And uh, even in our film, you could see there's a scene with all these other people from different countries uh, around the table as we're discussing a, yes. a, a drug trafficking deal. So it was quite researched. And then I did my research and I then got in touch because uh, you can meet all kinds of people in Beverly Hills. So I, I did meet people that were with the PLO and I met with people. Well, this was for the terrorists on trial. But now for this, I met the architect of Pablo Escobar's house. In How Medellin. do you find somebody like that? You yeah. know, the word is on the street, and then all of a sudden somebody says, oh, you're going to meet somebody. He's from Colombia, because he yeah, was a no. Colombian, and I was now researching the music and learning the music from the cumbia, the cumbia music and the uh, paisas dialogue, about Maria Sombre, which is a paisa kind of talk. But, I, you know, they didn't want a heavy accent, so I did a very subtle thing on that mm -hmm. and uh, went to the music to get the feel of Sanchez. And uh, then discussed it with Michael. And as uh, they were writing the screenplay, more and more things happened. And I made some suggestions that they accepted. And uh, it was very collaboratory. And uh, John Glenn was absolutely terrific. And Timothy and I, you know, that first meeting we meet in the office? Yes. And we laugh. Yeah. Well, that happened. Uh, we That happened to both of us in the uh, when we first met. It was like <laughs> that kind of uh, humorous thing and we hit it off terrifically because timothy's a terrific actor and understands the process yes so that's basically you know because of that little introduction by tina broccoli yeah uh, i became uh fran sanchez wow that's awesome well and the thing too is you talk about how you and timothy hit it off yes your character wouldn't have worked with like a roger moore's version of bond uh, I don't no think. i mean that that whole mirror image wouldn't have worked there so it no. was like a perfect pairing well, it was a title fight. It was really a heavyweight title fight because both of us were formidable physically yep. and uh, uh, around the same age. Where prior to that, you've had Bond villains that were, you know, uh, not as formidable physically, uh, but they had an, a thing behind them. So this was then a good pairing of of being able to have that mirror image of, uh, of Bond and the villain. Yep. It was. It was a perfect pairing. And you you could see throughout the whole thing, even when... He wins you over to your side for a while there. This The relationship between you guys throughout the whole movie is just terrific. Just Yes, awesome. and, and I played um, Sanchez more like Bond, you know, yeah. and Timothy, I think, played Bond more like Sanchez. Hey, that's that's a good point. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's yeah, Absolutely true. That's because good. of the mirror images. I've always liked the Sean Connery one-liners, you know, that he would count. And, you know, mm -hmm. they gave me so many, like, laundered or loyalty is more important to me than money. 
which I think I may have put in or not. And uh, finding the Achilles heel of Sanchez uh, going through the script. Yeah, I was going to say, when you went through the script, what did you think of it? Did you think, hey, I could add a lot to Fran Sanchez here? And did you add elements to that from your, you know, you grew up in New York and Manhattan and Queens and so on. I mean, you got some street toughs. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I, I I got into the, the into the character of uh, of what I was playing and and in the research of it and uh, like I said I went to the music, yeah of uh, of the paisas and uh, the the mentality of uh, someone like Pablo Escobar and Carlos Leather. There was a there was a triumvirate of drug lords at the time. It was Carlos Leather, uh, Pablo Escobar, and um, Ochoa. Yeah. There was a guy named Ochoa that was a very big drug lord. So I delved into their lives, their lifestyle, and uh, then extracted uh, the inner life of what these men would be like. Mm -hmm. And I, I approached it like they were a businessman. I think I said it at the time, Mr. Sanchez is the head of a, of a major billion-dollar corporation. That's what we loved about your character. You you had a believable character. You know, you you didn't want to create a new race underwater. You didn't want to go to the moon. You didn't want, you wanted to go to outer space and control the world. You had a little drug empire you wanted to protect. You wanted and, loyalty and money. Loyalty and money, and you played it off perfectly. Tom and I were talking. I, I you know we went through the entire movie multiple times. There, I think there's not a spot in that movie that you could have done anything differently that would have made it better. That's how we think. Oh, thank you. Your thank you. I appreciate that. So I have, I have one question on that. As you get into this character and you're you're studying these other people, and then you're on camera, you're in role, they say cut. How long does it take you to get to the point where you're Robert Davi again versus Fran Sanchez in your head and how you're behaving? Is it is it a light switch you can turn off, or does it take you a little bit to unwind it? Well, during the whole shoot, I, I, uh, some people said he thinks he's Sanchez. I, I, I mean, I remember one of the first elements of, uh, of the hotel room that they put us in in Mexico City when I felt it was not up to the standard of a Fran Sanchez. So I went to Polanco, and, uh, which is outside of Mexico City, uh, and there was a new hotel, the Hotel Nico, and I went to the Hotel Nico, and some of the people recognized me and I went to their marketing department and I cut a great deal on a, on a hotel suite with a piano in the room and everything else. <laughs> and then that got to, uh, they, they then made a deal for other people in the, in the film <laughs> when they saw that I was there. Yeah. So that was the Sanchez aspect of me wanting to have a, 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 a suite and a surrounding <laughs> that I could uh, believe in my character. And, um, you know, it's, it's even when we went out to dinners and stuff uh, at, as a team uh, and w with Benicio and with Talisa Soto yeah. uh, and with Timothy several times, you know, it was a, a fun experience and I was playing. There's always a slow burn of a character. You don't fully express the character, but there's always some kind of thing because you're looking for behavior, something you might find in it just in terms of life at the time when you have a part that warrants that, you know, sometimes it's not something you can really do to, but uh, on that one I did. As a matter of fact, even the relationship with Benicio, yeah. Yeah. you know, that, that came out, I figured he was like a, a younger brother okay. or a relative and the affection that I would have for him. And uh, uh, there was that one spot uh, where, and, and I know the Latino, you know, the people are not afraid to show physical contact with each other. There's yeah. no homophobic aspect to it. Right. And, uh, I put that into the uh, to the thing with my relationship uh, with uh, with Dario. Yeah, that was terrific, and everyone always wonders that too. But I think you have explained it perfectly there, because you know Italians, Latinos were very fond of hugging each other and whatever, and that showed in the film too that you guys were close. And well, yeah, even even like the touch, the thing where you like touch the side of his face, yes, yes, and it was. I mean, right. it's like that seemed very natural. So yeah. yeah. This is good because a lot of times people will ask you, you know, what motivates you as an actor and whatever. And our question here was really what motivated Fran Sanchez. And that's what you've been talking about, which I think is a different angle than what motivates you as the actor. You're mm -hmm. actually into the character and what motivates Fran Sanchez as the character. And that's, yeah. that's good stuff. Yes. And, and also, like, even in the opening. Now, Lupe, I always felt maybe if it was a different time, they would have could have handled it differently 
but the, let's say the whipping of Lupe, mm -hmm. which now I don't know how politically correct it would all be. But I always felt that was more of a sadomasochistic game that she played with Sanchez. Yeah, yeah. To see okay. if he cared about her, how much he cared about her. So she runs off with this guy knowing yeah. there's no way anybody's going to get away with that. Right. And that, I say, the your escapade. And, uh, you know, I, I had thought that she, it would have been interesting if there was, because Ian Fleming talked a lot about autoeroticism in that film, yes. in his books, and a lot of, and I felt that Lupe could have been titillated by the aspect of all of that. And it could have turned into a lovemaking moment after he whips her instead yep. of her crying and it being, but, you know, you're playing the villain, so you can't have that. But it would have been a nice, interesting twist. Yeah. That's one of the things um, I, I would have liked to have seen with that. Yeah, even yeah. later in the film, she when Bond sees the scars on her above her butt, she says, "Well, I deserved it." You know, I, you know, yeah, <laughs> whatever. So it was kind of like what you're saying there that it was maybe that kind of relationship. Uh, the pre-title sequence is one of the best pre-title sequences in any Bond movie. I mean, it's just absolutely flawless. And within seconds of seeing you, we know how evil <laughs> you are and what a character you are. And when they, you, they grab the guy, Dario grabs the guy out of the bed and is holding him. And you say, come on, say it. You, the heart, come on. <laughs> what did he promise you? His heart? Give me his heart. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the thing of it is, you see, on that, nothing that Sanchez had done was, if you analyze the actions of Sanchez, he, he was in, it was in response to what was done to him. Okay. Even the opening of the film. Yeah, yeah. She oh. betrays me, or this guy should know better. Right. This is yeah. Sanchez. You're going to do this, you're going to have to pay. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. that was the first. Okay. Then you have Felix Leiter. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to come after Sanchez at that time. Right. He could have left him alone, let him deal with his personal life. Yeah. And so there's a many, many, I think... The only unjustified kill of Sanchez, besides the obvious of Londrit with uh, Anthony Zerbi, because yeah. Bond sets him up as my Achilles yeah. heel of suspicion and betrayal, is the killing of Truman Lodge. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was getting under my skin and irritating me. <laughs> he was overhead. He was irritating. <laughs> <yes. laughs> That was a great scene. I love when you step on his hand to take. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it adds to it. Like boom. Yeah. And when I when I shoot, I think it was the first time. I hadn't seen it in the film till then. I don't know if somebody could research it prior to me doing it in License to Kill. But since people have done it, where I've killed somebody who's already dead. Yeah. Because he denied me his <laughs> the ability to kill him. Yeah. I go, you a puta, and yeah, I shoot. Yeah. Uh, uh, carry uh, Heratagawa when he takes his, uh, right, his right, poison. Right, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Cyanide. Yeah, that was an improv uh, thing. Yeah, was it nice? Oh yeah, I like, yeah. That. I like uh, that. See, that added a lot too. It shows again the dimension of the, <laughs> your villain, your villain, yeah. and your evilness. It's like yeah. Well, he was added. cheated out of punishing this guy, right. <laughs> so he, he's going to do it anyway. He did it anyway. Yeah, he's I wanted to kill him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I want to go back to the pre-title because there's some stuff in there that really sets up your character visually. And, you know, part of this could be because I'm reading this book on Hitchcock right now. And he talked in that book, they talk about how he wants like no expression on the face and then some subtle stuff. And you have so many deadpan looks that break into a smirk. Mm. And, and, and my favorite thing in the whole movie that you do is when you salute. <laughs> when you yeah, fly in the plane off. and you're leaving. Oh, and, and I you take salute off. those guys. Really? Really? <laughs> and to, to me, those, those are the kind of things it's like, that especially since it's at the beginning, it's setting the character up of this guy can be a smart ass, but he outsmarted them. And so he can for the be. moment. <laughs> yeah. For the moment, yeah. And and I just all those little smirks and stuff you do in that in the especially in the opening to set that character. And we talked earlier about the mirror of Bond and Bond having the quips. 
just visually you were quipping back with some of that stuff. And I just thought that was fantastic. Yeah. yeah, that was something that impressed Benicio at the time. He had said to me, he says, where did you come up with that smile, that being that way? Where yeah. did you come up with that? You know, because he was a great student of of acting and everything. Mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was just uh, how Sanchez was born in me, you know, how he. So that was you. That was not any direction from John Glenn saying, hey, can you smirk here or anything? No, 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 okay. no, no. That's just, you know, he wouldn't yeah. be that. Uh, you know, he he is a great director, and he does not, uh, he'll, he'll give you, uh, you know, uh, certain hints at things, but no, never anything like that. No, that yeah. was. And I think your laugh is, is got to be the most frightening laugh throughout. The, whatever you laugh in this movie, that's, <laughs> oh, man. Right. Hey, what? Okay, we're afraid of Sanchez, no matter what he's doing, laughing, talking, whatever. I'm scared. That's good stuff. Well, it's easy when you throw somebody to the sharks. You know, <laughs> you don't have to do much to make people crazy about it. You know, like, I know Cubby liked the line, "Today is the first day of the rest of your life," and then I go <laughs> like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bring him up. I mean, there was something about that Cubby responded to. It was funny. Yeah, yeah. I thought all those little subtle things you did with your face, your hands, and everything else really, again, added to the dimension of the character, which is really cool. The laugh, the, all, all of that stuff, and of course, you know. I want you to know this is nothing personal. It's purely business. Remember, you're only president for life. <laughs> Another great line, <laughs> right? I mean, there, there was a, there was a. I don't know if Timothy would remember this, but I remember there was a little bit of resistance of him doing one-liners, mm. and I remember somebody was telling me, you know, he didn't want to have it to be like that. But then as I was getting all these great lines, you know what I mean? Yeah. He then realized, all right, let me do, from, from what I remember, uh, John telling me, uh, uh, there was some, some thing like that. Yeah. Yeah. So Glenn was a great director, obviously. Yes. He did most of the, Bond, he did more Bond movies than anybody else. You loved working with him. You've talked I about did. that a little bit. Any other insight into John Glenn, working with John Glenn or? Oh, just that he's just so, efficient and prepared and uh, there's no nonsense and it's very comfortable very relaxed creatively it's a very it was a very untense set and the circumstance that he creates for you to live in there was nothing when you went on the set or when i went on the set and i went no, no, this is not right you know what i mean i don't feel i gotta dig myself out of this now how am i gonna dig myself out of this scene the circumstance isn't right everything was absolutely uh spot on and uh, just a let you bathe in the production. And that's the, the time spent with the Bond films. And, uh, you know, because that was the last film that I think the original team put together, end of an era in a certain way. And now we have the new era with Barbara and Michael. There was also, um, John has a great sense of humor. He loves humor. He enjoys, if it's something humorous and funny. I've told this story before, you may not know it, what I'm doing, uh, we're in the, I'm in the upper inner sanctum of my casino when we're looking what Bond is doing. And, uh, you know, I have this iguana now it's on my shoulder that I, I can't ignore the iguana. I had to be, I had to make the iguana be affectionate to me and love me. And uh, it didn't like uh, Talisa Soto. It, it, okay. it snarled at her. She was afraid of the damn thing. So that line, when she says it, you know. What, was that a written line or was that just her ad-libbing of I don't I, You know, I forget that. I, I don't know. I, I don't know, but it, it may or may not, but it knew. The iguana knew she didn't like him. And uh, but the, and then there's a certain point, and it's more extended. Uh, it didn't make the total cut. A little piece of it did. When the iguana all of a sudden just goes right to my ear. And then I continue playing yeah really <laughs> you think so huh? mm. and i do this little dialogue with the iguana like he's telling me a secret and uh, it was uh it was quite funny and john glenn is laughing and loving it and uh i remember we're doing a scene and he's going um look at that alex look at that get tighter give me a tighter shot He's fantastic. Look at those eyes. He says, more in one look than anything. I just love it. Go tighter. Go in there. Brilliant. Brilliant. And, you know, I'm doing the scene and I'm, you know, pumped up inside as I'm hearing a little bit of this. I'm going, interesting. Yeah. Okay, good. And then cut. All right. And John comes over. You are just so marvelous. Just let me tell you how fantastic you are. And he goes down to the iguana. It was beautiful. <laughs> 
you're just the spectacular, you're the best actor in the picture. You're wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I says, Jesus, John, I thought you were talking about me for God. And he just howled, howled. He just loved that. That's I think that was good. one of his favorite movement, uh, moments. So I've and got was, a couple comments on this iguanas thing, because I just love this iguana. And I love it. One of the things we do in our podcast is we try to talk about where something gets kind of borrowed from another movie or is influenced by another movie. And the, the diamond necklace on that iguana just screams. And remember, Eon didn't have the rights to Blofeld at this time. So it just screamed like a total, you know, F you to Blofeld or something with the diamond around this iguana. Yeah, I don't know. I, I wasn't privy to that, uh, you know, behind the scenes thing. Mm -hmm. I just know that it was a great thing to have the, to have, I think it was more of a thing to Lupe. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, she accepted it. Now the, you know, the iguana has this, this, uh, diamond necklace around its neck yeah, yeah. you know she... i see iguanas a lot because i spent some time in the caribbean and I, that thing was so docile and i can't imagine picking up an iguana and actually having it stay on your shoulder they had iguana wranglers okay. and the iguana did like me the iguana just for some reason stayed now they cool the iguana if they cool the iguana he becomes very docile okay. okay when it heats up that's when it gets to be a little bit rowdy okay now, I don't know if they did anything else. I don't think so. There was never any untoward thing to the animal at all. It was treated very well. And uh, he just liked me. My scent, who knows what? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Lupe came around, and maybe he didn't like the perfume. It turned into a different animal. <laughs> mm. Okay. And, uh, it, was, uh, it was interesting. So, um, yeah, no, the iguana was... Uh, they they and, and if there was a, a while before between takes, they would put it in this cooler to keep okay. it to keep it chilled okay keep it comfortable and not heat up yeah yeah it looks like they got along with you really well <laughs> you got the lights it's going to heat up too so yeah. yeah so was there like a length that you could film with it where it would remain docile i don't remember but it was probably uh somewhat you know mm -hmm. i mean there was not anything uh you know because you don't want to with with any animal you don't want to overuse it or over Right. exhausted in any sense because right. then you won't get the best performance much like actors yeah. you know you've got <laughs> yeah just every, them, every time keep i see them that, fed and cool they'll be all right yeah. every time i see that scene it's like how'd they get the iguana to do that <laughs> yeah well like i said he did like me yeah that helps that helps all right we got the iguana in the cast so that's good and he did a good job john yes. a lot <laughs> yes he did Let's talk about the rest of the cast. I mean, you got to work with some pretty cool people here. With Benicio del Toro, Carrie Lowell, Talisa Soto, of course, Anthony Zerba, Frank. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, yeah. no one, no one knew Talisa, Talisa, or, right. or or Benicio at the time. That was his first big film. So, yeah, he had done Pee Wee's Great Adventure. He played the dog faced boy in that, and but this was his his big break. Yeah, yeah. His first film, and we spent five months together doing it, and. Uh, yeah, he was very, you know, he's a terrific actor and studied also with Stella Adler that I did with uh, later on. Yeah, he, he was awesome in it. And, and really, he looked like your henchman, <laughs> the guy that you would believe would be your henchman. Yes, he and also so the knife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. So evil. And then the honeymoon thing. I know he said he had lived the, the honeymoon part. Yeah, John loved that. it. Yeah, Benicio oh, just yeah. nice. Honeymoon. We gave her a nice honeymoon. That was, was perfect. Great and honey. John yeah. laughed and loved it. He loved the quirks. That's what yeah. I mean about John being able to encourage an actor mm -hmm. not to uh, be afraid to, you know, somebody else could have said, no, 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 no. it's honeymoon. Don't give me honeymoon. Yeah, but John yeah. knew that eccentricity was perfect. Again, that added that other dimension of evilness to what yeah. they did was terrific awesome so you keep in touch with any of these people i mean any of them yeah every now and then i'll touch into you know you know uh, timothy may pop up uh, every couple of years or okay. hear from talisa or benicia you know not frequently but every now and then all right we heard you're pretty funny you were pretty funny on the set you have any stories that you could share that maybe you haven't shared, maybe something different, a little angle. Well, there was a little thing little that, uh, I don't know if you know the story with, uh, <laughs> I guess it fed it fed me, and he's a great kid, Anthony Stark. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, but uh, he was. Uh, he went to my uh, my uh, college. He went to Marquette. 
Oh, he did? I chatted with him on uh, Twitter. <laughs> Good did, did he tell you the hashish story? No, no, no. <laughs> so me and Benicio were in the makeup trailer. I think it was in Mexicali. You know, when we're shooting all those out, those, you know, running away from things or whatever. I forget where it was, but we're in a makeup trailer. And we're, you know, BSing just as we're waiting. It was cool in there. And we were doing our makeup. And there was a the makeup artist. Uh, there's an old trick. If you don't have some of the stuff for shading, you can use burnt cork. You light a cork on and it can give you shading. So this burnt cork was on the counter of the makeup trailer. And Benicio and I are sitting and we're talking and, and Anthony comes in the trailer and he sees this cork thing. You know, we talk, he goes, hey, what's that? I go, oh, shit. I go, what's that? That's, uh, that's hashish. He goes, what? I go, hash. He goes, really? I go, yeah. Yeah, smell it. And I put it up to his nose. And when I put it up to his nose, I go like this with the cork. And now he sees in the mirror this charcoal mark down his nose. <laughs> and he's a good kid. He was young. But you got to realize I had done Raw Deal and every film I did with Sinatra, everybody, Clint Eastwood, there were practical jokes all over the place. You guys would pull on each other. That's how, just what you did. It was fun. Yeah, yeah. But he got terribly, terribly nervous about it. And I think uh, he, got, he got very, very emotionally upset. I think he, he, so... And uh, later that night, we're at the, the hotel, ready to go to dinner. And I come downstairs to have dinner. And John comes down and he goes, Robert, what did you do to poor Anthony Stark? What do you mean? He goes, what did you do to him? I'm like, what do you mean? Well, he's upstairs and he's, Bob was quite upset. And he's, he was, he, I don't want to say that, that this was the thing, but this is what John told me. He broke out in hives. <laughs> okay. He was so upset. And he was very distraught. And I said to, uh, uh, I said, what do you mean, John? I said, it was a joke. I said, here's what happened. I said, are you kidding me? He said, well, Barbara's quite upset, you know. Poor young Anthony. He says, what you, what you do to him? And John laughed a little bit. And then Barbara, of course, Davi, what did you do to Anthony later on? I said, oh, my God, I'm sick of hearing this. I did nothing to Anthony. I says, it was a joke. You understand? It was just this and that and the other thing. And... Uh, uh, you know, I did raw deal with Schwarzenegger, and we shot in Chicago. Ah, okay. And the first time I met Arnold, I had never met him before. And uh, I'm coming down the hotel, out of the hotel, to go to a dinner. And he's coming in with his entourage, with the uh, stunt guy and his, uh, his stand-in and a couple of his friends. And they all see me, and they go, oh. You have a, you know, they, they told Arnold, this is a great actor here. He's got a great face. And uh, and I had this, Jean-Paul Gaultier just had a new line of overcoats. And it was this maroonish overcoat cut very interestingly. And I had it on. And uh, Arnold sees me with it. And uh, he goes, ah, this is Gaultier. He goes, I have the same coat. I go, yeah. I says, yeah, I'm going to wear it in the film. He goes, hmm, like this. And... Uh, Anyway, so his, his friends tease him a little bit. Yeah, this guy has a good act. He's got a great face, man. He's strong, Arnold. You have to, you know, so they're winding him up a little bit. So now we're shooting, and the practical jokes start to happen. And uh, the camera is here, and I come in. John Irvin, great English director, directed it. He directed Turtle Diary and Hamburger Hill. And I come into the set, and uh, me and Arnold are there together, and uh, we're looking at you, per se. And his friend goes, you can hear that sound. And what? And I, he does that, and I go like this. Now, if you're facing, if the camera's here, and you do that, you're blocking the camera with your hand. So the director goes, Robert, don't put your hand up, please. Don't. You're blocking the camera. I'll say, okay, John, take two. No, no, you're still, your arm blocked the camera. Don't put your hand. Okay, take three. I, no, you can't put any hand up. Please, don't put your hand up. <laughs> Take four. He goes, I told you, don't put your hand up. Keep your hand down. Okay, John. Take five. And this toothpick with a ribbon is stuck in my hair. And camera, it's right in camera. So, because the camera is behind my, yeah. my head. And uh, then John goes, oh, my, Sven. 
And this was uh, Arnold's friend who was doing the joke of it. So I then figured, okay, the game is on. Now, Arnold, we're in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, and Arnold was talking to Maria and Lou Pitt, who was his agent at the time. And I could hear him. I'm upstairs. He's downstairs. Yeah, Lou, you know, I tell you right now, Maria, this is, has to be like this. Yeah, we're going to go. And I go out, and, and every once in a while I'm hearing, you know those things that crackers, they're called crackers that you throw at the window and they explode? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's throwing them to my window. You know, because we became friends. So he's, I says, ah, I look, I peek out. And I say, ah, okay. He's got this beautiful Churchill, Davidoff, just lit, smoking the Cuban one when they had them in Cuba at the time. And I time it. I go to the bathroom. I get the garbage pail, clean it out, put soap suds in it and water. And then I open the door and I wait for him to go right underneath the door here, talking, yeah, Lou, you know what I'm telling you now here? We have to make this next deal here with Karolko. has to be right away here. And I dump the soap suds on his head. It was a bullseye. And now on Schwarzenegger's cigar, you know, a normal human being, you throw from above, you go like this, right? You look up, yeah. what the hell? Not Arnold. Arnold just goes like, the, the, the water, imagine, soap suds, cigar coming down. Yeah. Full... All he does is this. He goes, <laughs> this means war. <laughs> and goes back. So then the games. So this is what I, you know what I mean? We yeah. came with, and, and then with the first film I did with Sinatra, Harry Guardino and mm. guys did practical jokes. You did practical jokes. That's fun. Well, you guys do have a good time. Even though you're working hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to have, uh, you know, you relieve the tension and you, you yeah. do all of that, even yeah. on the, all right, so let's get back to Bond for a second, and I want to talk about Grand L. Bush. So you, this was the second movie I think you did with him. Yes, we had done Die Hard before. Right, and so, but it wasn't the last Because movie. I was already signed to do Bond, but Die Hard went prior. Okay. It was interesting. And it, uh, yeah, so we just uh, met on that. I didn't know he was going to be part of the Bond film. Oh, you didn't? That okay, time. that was going to be my uh, question. Uh, is, did you have any influence in getting him in there? No, no, no. Okay. He just showed up, which was great. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. Because the, cause the interaction guy. with you guys in Die Hard was just fantastic. Yes. Yeah. I, mean, I just love when he yells at you. It's like, yeah. So that was, that was good. So, yes, I was in high school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you dick. <laughs> oh, dickhead. Yeah. Dickhead. Oh, dickhead, yes. Yeah, that was, that was good. So that was, so it just was a coincidence that you were both in the... In the yeah, in the, yeah. Okay. I mean, you've, been, you've done a few with Chaz. But, yes, yes, um, Chaz and I are good friends. I directed him in The Dukes. I don't in The know Dukes, if you've yeah, seen we that. want to talk about that. That was bit. fun. That was, great that was a great, that we really liked that movie. Yeah. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. I'm Italian. We're both Italian. Oh, good, 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 good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. All my so grandparents he, are from Italy. So. But so, so when, when you get these things, it just is coincidence that you're not really influencing saying, hey, I've done work with this guy. Can you get him in here? No, no, no. Sometimes you do, but no. I mean, Benicio, I got into, uh, into, into Christopher Columbus. But I had recommended him because uh, they were looking for this character in Europe. And I said to John, and John had thought the same thing. Let's get Benicio for Alvaro. That was one hell of a cast. Yes. <laughs> that really was. Casting is so critical in that why we, again, License to Kill, they did a great job of the casting with, you, you got, like we said, to work with some terrific people there. So is there anything about License to Kill and the filming of it or anything that went on in the background that most people don't know about or wouldn't know about that you could tell us anything, any kind of, um, some I little... had to learn to scuba dive for that scene off the, uh, did you? Yeah. I was going to ask you if you were really underwater. Yes. Like, yes. Underwater yes. In the armor. yes I had to learn to scuba... to yeah. No, I had to learn to scuba dive to take that. I, I got actually certified because oh. of it. Because I had to do that underwater, how to take it out. And, you know, they wanted a close up of me doing that, you yeah. know, and then swimming off a little bit. Then they had stunt doubles to do the uh, wide shot. We shot at Churubusco Studios in Mexico City. I met Alexander Jodorowsky there and Gabriel Marquez, who, did a, who wrote 100 Years of Solitude. I mean, it was very interesting. Ah. And the crew and everybody in Mexico was uh, uh, spectacular. They were great. Just the enjoyment of, I know a cubby got a little bit ill one time because of the height, the altitude. Oh, yeah. And, and everyone yeah. was concerned about that for him. It was just a great, and, and we, I used, I learned how to play conquers with the set, with the camera crew. 
Conquers is a game that the uh -huh. English play where you take a chestnut and you tie a string to it. Yeah. And then you have to hit the other guy's chestnut and it goes until it breaks. And whoever wins, whosever chestnut doesn't break after a period of time, is the conquer. Okay. And uh, it, it's a, a very, very... They, the, so they taught me how to play that. But what they didn't teach me was how to prepare the chestnut. So they were getting a kick out of destroying my chestnut. <laughs> because they can. There's a certain way that you, you, you do something, shellac them, or you do something to make them stronger. And uh, they got oh, a kick. Yeah. yeah, they got a kick out of that. But the camera crew, I remember the uh, whole, the whole crew. They, these were great guys, yeah. and uh, the stunt crew, all Weston and everybody there. Um, you know, just it's like a. It was a big family. Yeah, that's what they always say about the Bond movies. That it yeah. is a family kind of thing, and so your experience supports that. That's, that's yeah. Cool. yeah, and even and even uh, you know, I went on a press tour for for four months. And I think I, I, I think I pissed off Barbara one time because uh, I was on the press tour for like four or five months. And I think I over overshot my uh, my expense account. <laughs> I, I, I think I still was in Sanchez mood. And, <laughs> and I think I was calling the I was calling the driver from Rome because I was excited to see how the film did. So I had this driver, Walter in Rome. And I called them to see how the film opened in Rome. And I, I know Barbara had said, she's Dobby, what are you calling the Walter for in Rome? You know what I mean? It's, I, you know, I just was, you know, it was just, it was funny. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, License to Kill, I think, was one of the few movies that wasn't filmed much in a studio. I don't know if they use any studio stuff. Did they use any? Churubusco, Churubusco Studios Churubusco, yeah. in Mexico. Yeah, yeah. Did, right? yeah it was just yeah. not Pinewood, Dan. It was just but not, not out of Pinewood, yeah. but all the Florida locations and everything oh, else. Oh, yeah, all Key West. Those were all practical yeah, that was, locations. Tom and I visited all of the locations. Oh, in, how nice. Yeah, it's, uh, how bad is it going to Key West? I, mean, I know, <laughs> right? There's a funny story about Don Stroud. Okay. Don was a bit of a partier. He plays Heller, my chief of security. Uh, so it's early on because Key West was the beginning, and I think he had we hadn't met him yet in person. So uh, I, I, Benicio and I are in my hotel suite and uh, sitting down. And I, I hey Don Stroud's here. Go, Let's call him up. So uh, I call up Don Stroud's room again. Hello, Don. This is John Glenn. Uh, we'd like you to come up for a uh, for a little fitting, a uh, little discussion on your wardrobe. But could you please come up? Oh yeah, sure, okay. Now he'd been under the weather. Now this guy had he'd been partying. <laughs> I knew this, and Benicio knew it. So now he comes on, and his he was he was just a mess. He comes. To, I said, come to this room. So he comes to the room, and he sees us, and he's all this. And he says, "You son of a gun!" And he just starts to crack up laughing. So Don was a bit of a partier, great guy. Mm. Uh, he kept going to this place called Sloppy Joe's, which well, was a, we've been there. We, we know was, that bar. <laughs> you know that bar. So Don was always at always at Sloppy Joe's, dancing away those yeah. surf moves that those guys do, right? <laughs> so he's there, I know, and he's he's looped up. And I tell Benicio, I go, let's tease him. And I says, <laughs> now around the pool they had all these. You know those life things that you throw to people, you know, the, the life tubes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Lifesaver life kind of thing. Yeah, the, yeah. the lifesaver So those are like decorations with ropes around this pool area. So I says, let's get these. So I get that, get the rope, tie it to his room. I then <laughs> go around uh, the pillars of the place. <laughs> and then he he's looking for... He wants to get uh, he wants to get some more alcohol or something. I forget what it was, but it was uh, we had him tied in that room, and <laughs> all of a sudden he's, he tries to get out. We call him. He says, "You can come to the front desk and get your alcohol." So he tries and he can't open the door, <laughs> and because he's discombobulated, he's now panicking. Let me out! Let me out! Screaming! Let me out! And I'm laughing hysterically. But he's here, we're hiding on the side. So there was that kind of stuff that we, you know, did all the time. <laughs> well, that's, that's cool. That's fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. I, I've got another question about a filming location then, because you, you talk about down in the Keys. But 
is the Villa Arabesque as gorgeous as it looks in the film? Oh, yeah. Or is it that, that was, the camera just got all the good parts? Yeah, they were friends of Cubby Broccoli's. Ricky and Sandra de Portanova, who are no longer alive now. Uh, they were oil people. He was the count and, uh, uh, of uh, the Portanova. But um, yeah, Arabesque was beautiful. They had also separate rooms with little pools. And that made me feel Sanchez, of course. Yeah. And... Um, they were terrific people, but that was in Acapulco, and um, wow, yeah, that was a lot of fun there. Yeah, it looked beautiful. It was gorgeous. I just, you, you sometimes you're like, is that place really that good, or are we just seeing the? Highlights? Yeah, no, that was beautiful. That was a beautiful yeah, the place. Whole bar area where you're sitting with Bond and the yeah, the funiculare or whatever goes up. To, oh yeah, man. <laughs> gorgeous. yeah, that Talisa goes up. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> fabulous stuff. Oh, there's a funny thing at the screening for the Princess Trust where I met Princess Diana. Oh. I don't know if you know this story. So now we're doing, in the, we're in England and we have the premiere of this. And we're all told, you know, you have to be this with the royals and your royal highness and whatever your title you have to say. And, uh, you know, I was, you know, she was alluring and you want to see the princess, but you can't check her up and down. You know what I mean? <laughs> Here I am a kid from Astoria, Queens, and I'm meeting the prince and now the king and princess. And um, so we're in line. And uh, so I was like, she's a couple of people away. And I'm just like out of the corner of my eye, you know, I'm looking like this at her, <laughs> you know, I don't know if you can see, but I'm looking, you know, if, if you give a side glance, mm -hmm. you're still looking straight ahead. I've right. seen a picture of this, of this. You saw this? Yeah. So now she's coming by and that, and that, and I don't know that this is broadcast live in the theater. And I don't know, people are taking pictures all over the place. So the next day in the their newspaper what is bond batty thinking of lady Di princess diana and it was like oh my god you know an embarrassing kind of moment for me on that because uh, she was a beautiful yeah. woman you were checking her out i mean yes you know you know, you know hey. so but she was lovely as was prince charles very charming mm -hmm. and then at the party there was a party afterwards a great party with a lot of people and uh Vanessa Redgrave was there with her daughters and stuff. And I remember she was very, Vanessa Redgrave now comes to me and they say, you know, that you created an arc for a character that shouldn't have an arc. <laughs> she says, you, you know, I mean, she was very impressed. And that was the, she did pick that up because it was the, the suspicion, the Achilles heel of suspicion that I said, okay, this is my turning point where I can uh, have this uh, guy and you wait, you know what I mean? You wait. You don't know when the the emotional thing is going to happen. Right. Uh, you know, you have it. It has to happen organically. It doesn't happen on the page. It happens as you're living the character that you can now express where that rage is going to, you know, come out. And it did on top of that thing, go get Heller as my yeah, yeah. stuff's hitting the fan. And, yeah, yeah. and there's a moment when Benicio's put in that, that wood chip thing or whatever it is. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was, we were talking about the scene and he goes, I don't know what, what should I, you know, I says, well, who's the closest person to you? Yeah. Good. I says, that's who you call for. There and you when go. he went in there, he's yelling, Sanchez. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Sanchez. Yeah. That was good. Yeah, that was a great scene. I love when he's cutting the the cord there on on Bond and yeah, uh, yeah it's like it looks so evil, man. It's like, and that line, what I say, I says up to your neck, yeah, you know, that's a that's a oh yeah, a, it's a long line, so people don't quote it as much, but it's a very good line. Yes, yeah, play that Sanchez yeah. line. When you're up to your ankles, you're gonna beg to tell me everything. When you're up to your knees, you'll kiss my ass to kill you. <laughs> yeah, this, but no, it's a very good line. It is. At the end of the movie, the movie shot up at Rumorosa Pass. And I know there's lots of stunt people there. The way it was edited, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you were there, but I'm, the way it was edited, it almost looked like you, you didn't have to be there for some of the shots they got from you. But one of the things about Rumorosa is there's stories of some just bizarre happenings up at that pass. Did you experience any of that kind of stuff? Well, people did experience things and they talked about that. And a lot of it, the second unit shooting happened, you know what I mean? And the stunt guys did it and then they put us into 
yeah. stuff uh, after they had the sequence down. They knew what they needed. You know, John mm -hmm. is very smart. That's that preparation. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I, I got to say that when I do other films, there's so many times that the producers are watching Bond films and sequences of Bond films to get ideas and to get the, uh, I mean, there's not one person that I think in, that I've known, uh, even a guy like John Milius said, boy, to be a Bond villain, you know, how great is that? And uh, um, wow. other actors uh, or a Bond girl. But yeah, there was, uh, there was talk of some scary stuff happening there. I don't quite remember. Um, but you you never really saw anything goofy happen. No, nothing nothing that I experienced except the trepidation of them telling me that there's some kind of weird energy there that made me very cautious. <laughs> <laughs> now you know I played Bond. Oh yeah, yeah. why did you play Bond? That. Well, <laughs> Cubby and John want me to pick my girlfriend for the film. Mhm. Mm and um have you heard the story from John Glenn? No. No, oh. it's on the DVD. John Glenn tells the story because I thought it would be something people say he's full of garbage. And well, my kids, the story you tell the kids. So what happens is I uh, they want me to pick my girlfriend, Sanchez's girlfriend. They don't want me to f feel like I'm auditioning and put on the spot. So they say, just play Bond. You're going to play Bond to pick up your girlfriend. OK. And. I get 17 actresses and models, beautiful, around the world that I audition with. And uh, in the tuxedo, out the tuxedo, we did a couple of scenes, and uh, Bond, James Bond. And I do the, the, the bam, bada boom, bada bing, bada bang, bada bang, and I then know that Talisa Soto, Talisa came with a certain dress on. You know the dress that Carrie Lowell wears that the bottom comes out? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. With the gun is there. Well, Talisa wore that dress, and they liked it. So they created that dress for Carrie Lowell's character with the gun. Yeah. <laughs> so I knew that Talisa was, and I said to John and, uh, and Cubby, I said, that, that she's the one that, not my personal, but for Sanchez, he would risk his life for this girl. Mm -hmm. She was the one. So they're watching the tests, and John says to Cubby, you know, Cubby, Robert would make a terrific bond. <laughs> and Cubby goes, I think so too. I go, oh, come on, guys, stop it. He goes, no, many true things are said in jest. Anyway, that story John Glenn tells was interesting. Yeah. Would you have done it? Bond? Who wouldn't have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would. right. At that time when I was like, you know, in great shape and ready to take yeah. on the mantle of, of Jaime Bond, why not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jaime Bond. <laughs> if they asked you to come back to do something now, would you? Or would you? Of course, why wouldn't you? Because it would be a fun thing, but I don't think so. I don't think they okay. would ask me. It uh, would be nice if they said, hey, come and, but, you know, who knows? I always felt that Sanchez survived. <laughs> yeah, I know. You should have just taken Bond's head off. Right? I wanted, no, no, that, 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 that his guys ground him up, and now he's in some Swedish hospital on a breathing machine. <laughs> hard for Pretty life but he becomes this great guy that wants to then take revenge on on bond you know some interesting creature that he's that he that he, charred creature so wait you talk about potentially taking a different role in bond or doing another bond movie what's up with goonies too i mean in your imdb and in other actors from goonies the date keeps changing on goonies too and is that the goonies too is that thing going to happen look they're doing TV knockoffs now. Stranger Things, great show, and another show about. Mm -hmm. I don't. I've heard about this for decades, and uh, you can't. And the great Dick Donner passed recently, and right. so I don't know. I, I don't know. The time has passed. I think for the Goonies, they could have at one time done the Goonies too, which would have been a lot of fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always. I had an opening for the film as well, that we're in Potter's Field, exhuming our mother's body late at night, uh, because she has the secret to where. <laughs> The ship went. Wow. I mean, a whole, a whole crazy little thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then it unfolds. And then I'm singing in a, in a club, and Joey's managing me uh, and and stealing my money. <laughs> wow. uh, the opening of the Goonies was terrific with you and the cell hanging yourself and stuff. Yes. I mean, that, was just, that was a fun movie. Uh, yes, probably was. everybody knows you from the Goonies. Obviously, 
Yeah, Die Hard, Goonies, uh, Bond. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's and then other things. It's even Maniac Cop, you know. To, mm -hmm. I mean, the different people know you from different things. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Showgirls, Iceman, the Iceman. Yeah. Man, he did a lot of stuff. I mean, the Showgirls, that was an interesting little role there for you. I mean, you yeah, I had not done like anything that like that. I had not done anything like that. And Quentin Tarantino with Reservoir Dogs and everything was very, you know, prevalent at the time with the language and the yeah. edginess of things. Exactly. So, and Paul Verhoeven was a great director who I wanted to work with. And uh, Joe Estherhouse writing the screenplay, a Karelko film. And uh, I, the challenge for me was saying those, playing that character and humanizing him as well, because I had yeah, some yeah. very harsh lines. Yeah, yeah. That I had to deliver and and make it uh, make it uh, uh, take take a certain spin off it. So now you mentioned a movie that you directed uh, a few minutes ago called The Dukes. Yeah. And yes. so you wrote it, you produced it, you directed yeah. it, you starred wrote in it, it. Yes. You sang in it. I mean, some of the scenes were just hilarious. I mean, the 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 fake skeet shooting. You know, when you're in the <laughs> <guns. Yes. laughs> it just it just crash cracked me up um so talk a little bit about how that movie came about and with your involvement in it um uh -huh. you know how that happened there's a great scene i love that too the, the face mask and the snorkel oh yeah the onions. <laughs> cutting the onions As wednesday scene yes <laughs> as an italian from chicago too a lot you of understand life. that oh, yes man. yeah so what happened was um uh, in the night in the 70s there was an article in the new york times about steel workers getting laid off and it was disturbing because people that had a career for 25 years no longer had that job right and i'm a young man at the time and i'm looking at that and go wow that's terrible my you know my dad's and then a couple of years later he gets laid off from his job they shut general bronze and then he got hired for grumman's aircraft but um it, it, that had a disturbing aspect to me then i do this is in the mid 70s and now i do contract on cherry street with sinatra my first film and my who plays my brother in it is a guy named jay black from jay and the americans great rock and roll group yeah, he had yeah. a great voice and he had told stories of how he was, you know, selling out Madison Square Garden, cover, Cousin Brucey calling him the best voice in rock and roll. And now this guy is barely playing Jolly Rogers and other things, how the career went. So I said, wow, this happens in entertainment. entertainment. And then over the years, so I wrote down a treatment. I, I wrote a very extensive treatment. And, um, and then when I did Raw Deal, I got a writer friend of mine, James Andronica and uh, I said hey write this with me let's write the screenplay here's the treatment of it and I had a, like an 80 page treatment and we wrote the first draft and I was then going to raise looking for the money for it and that didn't happen I just put it in the drawer and then years later a neighbor in California uh, told me of a guy Frank Visco he goes, hey, maybe he'd invest. He, he can put something together. And he heard about the story. And uh, I met with Frank. And Frank said, I'll raise the money for you. He heard about this piece. Because I had talked about it. And he says, I remember reading about it. So he raised the money. And um, I then cast it. Of course, Chaz. I had always thought of Chaz and myself. Because we were friends. We could be cousins real easy. Miriam Margulies is one of the great English actresses. Mm-hmm. Um, I got uh, Valerie McCaffrey to do the casting um, and um, then started to put the film together and then uh, absolutely rewrote it as I was going, you know, in pre-production, putting in the Ash Wednesdays, putting in that Chaz. I said to Chaz one day, I said, Chaz, you're going to have a love interest, though, yeah? Yeah, yeah. she's going to be a big girl. He goes, oh, what, like, like Giselle Bunchen, you know. He's thinking supermodel right away. I go, yeah, she's going to be a big girl. She goes, he goes, really? How big? <laughs> big. What do you mean big? Big, Chaz. Big, big. What? <laughs> Let me think about this. <laughs> so I call him back. I go, you idiot. Every woman in the country is going to fall in love because it's not about looks. Mm -hmm. It's about, you know, a certain type that you like. 
Right. I says, and my mom was a big woman and she was very sexy. You know, I mean, she was very, you know, she was your mother. I said, so, you know, what's the difference? Anyway, I convinced him to do it. And um, uh, yeah, so so uh, it, it became a, uh, uh, and then later would, after Chaz was, people were saying to women, he was getting the messages. I love that you didn't go to a typical blah, 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 blah. I love it so much. And he goes, yeah, yeah, that was my idea. I go, you're so full of shit. It wasn't your idea. What are you talking about? Your idea. I go, I says, I had to convince you to play it. And then, and also another funny story is we're, we're filming. And I had a very clear vision of the picture of when I direct, I, you do when you, and there was a line and Chaz was, ah, I want to change. I said, no, Chaz, there's a rhythm to the line. I want you to say the line. And he looks over to Peter Bogdanovich. He goes, Peter, tell him. And Peter goes deadpan as he is. He goes, listen to your director, Chaz, Robert's right. And that was it. So you, cause, cause when you're close to somebody, you can challenge, right? Just right, for right. whatever the hell, just for the hell of challenging, who knows what. And, uh, that changed and it was it was a great experience we had a lot of fun peter bogdanovich he's directed i think like 30 something movies and having a guy who's an actor who's got that much directing chops is there was there any him trying to influence or because he was there he could say that to chaz and chaz would just kind of like okay yeah no because he saw he loved the script he <laughs> loved the character he saw what i was doing and he knew Okay. You know, it's not, it was, yeah, there was no, not in the least that he turned director. He became the actor. Awesome. Uh, and trusted me uh, implicitly with everything. And uh, it was uh, just a great experience. And he says, when are we doing the next one, actually? And I wish I had, oh, yeah. I wish I had something else to do with him because we had a great time and he's a great person and he passed away recently. Yeah. And I really had a fondness for him. Yeah. I spoke yeah. to him just a couple of months before he passed. Hmm. I wish I had met with him, but he was a great person. We had a, a wonderful time on that picture. So getting back to Jay Black. So uh -huh. taking that story about entertainment, I then thought, let's make this about a doo-wop group. Mm -hmm. Doo-wop group that, because uh, my friend, my co-writer had talked about Vito and the Salutations and these other old New York groups. Yeah. Uh, and that was then the seed of that. And uh, then... Um, it became uh, what it is. Well, I tell you, I really love your rendition of So Much in Love at the end of that movie. I oh, thank that you. Was, that was really a great way to cap that. You have a, yeah. you have a great voice. You have a great voice. So we'll yeah. talk about that in a second. Uh, but, man, terrific stuff. The singing tomatoes. It was just. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the film won nine awards with. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it was in Rome Film Festival, as you probably saw, you know, mm -hmm. that tremendous response. Yes. And Anybody sure. out there hasn't seen it? See it, the Dukes. Great movie. The Dukes. Fun stuff. A lot of fun. All right. It's on Amazon Prime right now. You can you can rent it there. Yes. Yep. 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 And you can get my album, Dobby Sing Sinatra, on Amazon or iTunes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Your first role was with Sinatra. Um, obviously growing up in New York when you did, Sinatra would have been you know, I think you once said it's he him and the Pope and Not we'll necessarily in that order. Yeah. So, it was the Pope and Sinatra. Yeah. Yeah. So but because he was also he, what he did for the Italian immigrant and also what he did for the he was against racial bigotry and, and anti Semitism of yeah. all kind. Yeah. And he, that was uh, when you look to him, he, he had done film. I was singing. I loved opera at the time. Uh, so he was always something that was to me the, the apex of, uh, of, of, of the American songbook. And his loving of opera and classical music, as well as you can hear, he was the first singer, I think, mm -hmm. to put bel canto into popular music. You had crooners, but the depth of his of his ability to interpret and uh, certain phrasing and everything else was just very extraordinary. Yeah, and so you did. You, so you ended up doing a tour and an album. I did an album, and I, I was frustrated that I didn't feel that there were singers that were ex providing the experience that Sinatra was able to give on the stage. Um, he, don't forget, had a big film career. He had a certain kind of edge, which I have. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, uh, the depth of voice that he had. So it was never my intention to do the American Songbook. It was always the opera. 
and and he loved the opera as well. But then he realized the songbook was a better expression for his his, his overall voice, which I did. And then I did this uh, because Sinatra covered Bing Crosby. I mean, if he was, uh, it would have been, you know, Sinatra sings Bing Crosby. That's that's what it because those those songs from the Great American Songbook and Tin Pan Alley, everyone covered. Tony Bennett, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You make them your own, but you. But I wanted to pay tribute to Sinatra's memory leading up to his 100th anniversary because of the, not only Picasso's contribution to his music, uh, but also, and his art as, a, as, a, as, a, as, an, as an actor and entertainer, but his, uh, his social uh, positions with mm -hmm. uh, racial bigotry and anti-Semitism and helping the Italian American. People talk about his mafia connections, which were, you know, peripheral and interesting, but, and maybe women, uh, but the bigger aspect was what he did in, 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 in those, in those other areas. Oh yeah. With, with Sammy Davis Jr. I mean, there was yeah, just, you know, yeah. right. he, he, he took a show to another casino because they wouldn't let Sammy. And it's like, okay. Yeah. yeah. And Dean Martin, the same way, you know, Dean, yeah. Dean was supposed to sing at the inauguration. And when Kennedy wouldn't let Sammy Davis Jr. sing at the inauguration, or not Kennedy, but the people around, who knows what, yeah. Dean pulled out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's good that they did that. Yeah. Man, because that was not popular at the time, supporting, you know, that kind of anti-racism stuff and no. anti-Semitism. And, and, you know, don't forget the Italian-American you guys being Italian-American, the New York Times said the Italian-American was, they said pretty harsh words in 1906. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there were more lynchings of Italians in New Orleans than anybody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't like the divisiveness that we're seeing today. Uh, we should be brought together and not split up. Totally uh, agree with you there. We should not be splitting up and causing, um, you know, difficulties I, uh, without getting you know, into any kind of politics, which we could if you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll probably we'll probably steer clear of that except for you've got some, you know, when I look at what what's on your plate and what you've just done, right? You've got a bunch of stuff that is in post or pre production, but you also just released My Son Hunter. Right. And so Have you seen it? I have not seen not it yet. yet no. But it's it's on my list, but I haven't gotten there yet. You can go to mysonhunter.com. Okay. And you can download and you can buy the dvd okay but you should see it it's a it's a fun well, film i yeah. i fashion it off the wolf of wall street and uh, and uh, american hustle the david o russell film mm -hmm. and uh, i don't indict hunter has a drug addiction mm -hmm. i've had family members that have addiction problems i don't demonize that aspect to it but i do question the influence peddling that happened while the, the vice president and president they were on the same plane together to China and other places. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting film, but it's told through the eyes of a 25 year old left wing activist who works as an exotic dancer uh, to pay for her college education. And she meets up with Hunter at a strip joint, and it becomes very textured that, that those moments. And um, through her involvement with Hunter, she finds out who he is. She mm -hmm. doesn't know at first, except he's a VIP. And I've had friends of mine who, uh, who are Democrats. Uh, I'm, I'm more of a middle of the road conservative, but uh, Democrats uh, that are absolutely uh, uh, like the film. Oh, good. Yeah, like well, I'm, I'm looking forward. I will. Bit. I will watch it. I just haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, we'll definitely see it. So, yeah. I, I have two. There's two other films that I wanted to talk about that you've done that are in post, I believe. And the one has one of the best titles I've ever heard of a movie, The Man Who Drew God. And I, I thought that was going to be Michelangelo, but it's not. So no. can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's uh, Franco Nero, terrific Italian actor and uh, director. He was married or married to Vanessa Redgrave. They have kids. And uh, mm -hmm. he's a great person, Franco. Been a friend of mine for years. And we shot it in Torino in Italy. Oh. And he plays a blind man who can paint you just from the feel of your voice wow. and do an exquisite job. Wow. And he gets accused of something that he's not guilty of. And I play his lawyer, <laughs> okay. uh, Advocato Fauci of all names to, to, to give me, <laughs> but I'm the lawyer Fauci. Hey. And uh, Kevin Spacey's in the picture. Mm -hmm. uh, he plays a detective and Kevin was just exonerated in New York City. Right. 
mm-hmm. the one that that lawsuit uh, was. And uh, Kevin was a great person. I met him there. I did not know him before, and he was quite philosophical, quite thoughtful, and um, quite honest. And uh, I, 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 we started a friendship, and um, uh, so. And then a great Italian cast, the rest of the Italian cast, and Faye Dunaway is also in it. Um, so it's. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what that, how that film pans out. Yeah, that's, it's it's it, like I said, it's best title. I mean, it's fantastic. Right, the man it's, who. And it that. sounds it sounds it sounds. The de Segno Dio in Italiani. Yeah. All right. So then, the last one I want to ask you about is you played Brezhnev in. Brezhnev, yes, Leonid Brezhnev. I played him. Yes. And. Uh, Talk small to, cameo in the Reagan film. Is that small? So, did you have to do a lot of background work there? Or are we really familiar with with? No, I always do background work. I listen okay. to voice. I listen to read everything I could about Brezhnev for the period of his life, and I do my own research. But small character, but had big eyebrows. <laughs> have, have very good Brezhnev eyebrows in the film. That he John had, Boyd, you know, <laughs> that he had, and uh, it's it's it it was a, a fun experience. I, I wish it was more in depth. They didn't explore Brezhnev's enough because when I researched Brezhnev, he was writing. He was looking for a partner in terms of Gladnosts or whatever they, you know. Uh, he, he was he was he was trying to find a way. Um, and um, I was researching and watching tapes, and I said he had to have known Ronald Reagan. He had to have met Ronald Reagan. And um, I look at a because uh, he was in power for so long, Brezhnev. Mm-hmm. And I watching this video where I think it was at the Nixon live Nixon and Brezhnev are talking and Q and A. And I watched this whole thing, and it was very interesting, and to watch his behavior. And then the last two seconds, I said, maybe they'll, ever, maybe they'll pan into the audience. I had a feeling that Reagan was there. Uh-huh. And just at the very end, the first person that goes up and shakes Brezhnev's hand that he greets is Reagan and Nancy Reagan. Wow. So I said... Because I was making the case, because in the script, again, I do very good research. And sometimes writers do and don't, but these guys were open. But still, it wasn't uh, enough for me. But I said, because they underestimate, they they have, they want to make it that Brezhnev underestimated Reagan. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't true. Uh, as a matter of fact, Brezhnev, there was an assassination attempt on Brezhnev in the late 60s by somebody inside his organization, a driver. And I said, wouldn't it be interesting if Brezhnev, who wanted to meet with Reagan, but died before he was able to, and then two other heads of state of Russia died, and then Gorbachev came into power, and then he meets with Reagan. But wouldn't it have been interesting had... Brezhnev made a phone call or did something, reached out to Reagan when he was in the hospital with his assassination. Yeah. That left an open door to some kind of thing. I says, and this is where I get uh, frustrated with, but I understand, you know. So it's a, you know, it's a John Voight and I have a n- nice couple of scenes together or a scene or two together. And he's a terrific actor and great mm-hmm. guy. And uh, he has a, a nice part in that. But I'm just a, I'm a I'm a cameo, but it was fun to play Brezhnev. Yeah, yeah, fun. All right, All right. hey, that's pretty good. I yeah. mean, and and let me ask you actually one more question, and I'm done with my list. You should play the house I live in, or some of my music. We will, the folks. Yeah, yeah. We will, we will. And speaking of music, here we have your permission. Yes, we have your permission to do that, right? Mm-hmm. So, you did a music video with Bob Dylan. Mm-hmm. It called the night they called it a day. And it's it it's it amazes me how in you know a three minute thing you can tell a story so vividly in something like that. What was the experience of doing that? We spent four days together, seventeen hours a day, and at the end of it, Dylan said to me, "He goes, you taught me more about acting than anybody else." Wow! And it was just about uh, a little thing I said to him, a couple of little things, 
but it was great. He was terrific to to to, to work with. I mean, such an iconic figure. Yes. And I think about it: Sinatra and Bob Dylan, Marlon Brando, <laughs> Clint Eastwood. You know, I had a pretty good, pretty good thing with meeting some of these wonderful, wonderful. I'm glad you said that figures. list because I was going to say that same list at the end. Yeah. So perfect, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You definitely, you definitely had people who had the pleasure of working with you over your career that were some pretty big names. So that's yeah. Great. Yeah. And Dylan liked my album of Sinatra. Yeah. He liked mine and he, my acting, of course. And yeah. so it was fun to be in that thing with him. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. I mean, you have done it all, really. I mean, you're a Renaissance man. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, I don't have the costume. <laughs> <laughs> got to get you a costume. Yeah. I got to well, get a little bit of wardrobe and costume on. You got the, you got a Merlin costume at once. <laughs> I did. I played Merlin. Yep. <laughs> Remember that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. What what one thing about Robert John Dobby keeps you going? Because you're you keep going. Well, I think I'm not finished. Okay. <laughs> I'm not finished. I think there's. There's uh, there's a hunger and there's still a uh, whereby I you know you can get tired sometimes, but there's still I still have my little three year old you know I have uh, six kids of my own and two stepchildren and I've got a wonderful wife, yeah. and I love the uh, I love singing, I yeah. love uh, entertainment and I love the work I love film, and um, there's more to say and I and I love this country. And, uh, you know, you, you feel that if you have any uh, ability to affect any kind of uh, uh, idea of keeping this nation on track, you know, it's your responsibility. And that's, uh, I think that also keeps me going, as well as the Toby Keith song, Don't Let the Old Man In. Yeah, <laughs> you know that song. song? Yeah. yeah, I keep singing it too because. Uh, yeah. Right, you know how that song came about. Do you know the story? No. Yeah. Toby Keith was playing golf with Clint Eastwood, and he much like said the same question you asked me. He says, "Clint, you got a young child. You keep going. You're 90 years old. You're directing. You're acting. How do you do it?" And he said to Toby Keith, "Well, I'll tell you. I just don't let the old man in." <laughs> and then Toby yeah. Keith went back and wrote that film, uh, song, and Clint put it in the the movie The Mule. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's a great song. It is. Yeah, yeah, very meaningful. So yes, I did a concert in this year with Bocelli, and then I did the Biscara Jazz Festival, <clears throat> and then I also did the Italian version of The Voice. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, my name Jax is a friend of mine, so I did the Italian version of The Voice, <laughs> which is a. Uh, uh, you know, like the, I was their guest artist. The week mm -hmm. before was Ariana Grande. I was the next one. You know, mm -hmm. nice thing. I sang a song and I said in Italian, Sonio Roberto Davi, Mi genitori mi mamma di Provenza di Avalino, Città di Nusco, Napoli. Mi genitori mi papà, vicino Palermo, Torretta. So, Sonio, mezzo Napolitano, mezzo Ciciliani. Ma io, nato l'America, New York, ma anima cori in Italia. So I basically said my mother's family was from Nusco, Naples. My father was from Torretta, his family, in mm -hmm. Sicily. The phone of the mayor of Torretta ran off the hook. <laughs> and he called Rye. And because uh, people would say, Torretese. And they then, Rye told me they want to invite me to Torretta to make me an honorary citizen of my father's, uh, mother and father's nice. hometown. Oh, that's, that's nice. 3,000 people in the town square. I thought a guy with a mandolin and, a, and an accordion. 3,000 people in the town square. Oh, my God. So emotional, as you can imagine. Oh, yeah. Holy God. That's a great story. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. And I, I found guess... out, they said to me, do you know why your father is called Salvatore? I go, no. Because he was supposed to be called Rafael after my grandfather's father. Okay. I was supposed to be called Franco after my father's father, but I was called Robert. Um, it's a long story. Mm -hmm. uh, but they go, look at this plaque here. You see this name, Salvatore Davi, with an accent over the eye, which my yes. grandfather always said the accent was over the eye, Davi. Yeah. Uh, he, he goes, that was your fa grandfather's brother who was killed in World War I. Uh, your father was named after your grandfather's brother. I never knew my grandfather had a brother. Yeah, yeah. You know wow. what I mean? So it's amazing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, What a great heritage. I mean, when I did Christopher Columbus, the discovery directed by John Glenn, I had notes for the character, Martin Pinzon. And I, you didn't have phones, so you had to fax them notes. Okay. And John said, don't forget, this is 92. He goes, when you come to Malta, we'll discuss them. So I come to Malta finally. And John meets me in the lobby of the hotel. He goes, well, but did you speak to the Spanish experts? I go, John, I didn't know there were Spanish experts. He says, are you sure you didn't speak to them? Because every change you suggested, they want made in the script. And we have to make them to get the seal from Spain and the <laughs> replicas of the ships. I goes, no, John, I didn't know. Because I was playing Martin Pinzon, who there's statues to in Spain. He's okay. as big as Columbus is. He goes, I said, all right. He goes, and plus they want to meet you. Why? He says, well, apparently they were Davies, your last name. Did it ever have an accent over the eye? I says, yes, my grandfather told me it did. He says, well, apparently there were Davies on all voyages, all three voyages with Columbus. Okay. I says, really? So now I go to Coretta. My grandfather's gone, nobody to talk to. And they show me the family crest. Oh. And they give me the family crest. Oh, wow. And it's from 1493 and Aragon, hey. Spain, Calabria. Wow. And it's the whole royalty of. So this then. Oh, my God. Yeah. So we were on voyages. I mean, how, go figure that. I it's, mean, that's amazing. Is that yeah. wild? Yep. Yeah, that is wild. That's wild. pretty amazing. That's a beautiful thing to have discovered. Yep. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. We discovered America. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> we put that out there. Davi discovers America. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, anyway. all right. Now, you've got your music show still going, right? I mean, you're you're still yeah, doing Yeah, yeah, yeah. We haven't done stuff. I'm, right. I'm, yeah, I'll be doing stuff in 23, you know. I'm, I'm doing a new album, so I'm laying low until my new album is finished, you know. Robert, if people want to find out more about your musical show and your uh, the stuff you're doing in the schedule... Where is the best place for them to look for you? Well, there's a website called Davi Singh Sinatra. So when that's active, I put stuff up there. You can get information on me on Instagram at Robert Davi. And also there's Facebook, Robert Davi or Davi Singh Sinatra. And uh, you can find me there. And then there's a there's a Twitter at Robert John Davi, but I get a little political, so I don't want to... <laughs> you, you, know, you may not want to hit that one up. Just before yeah, one, yeah. right? So. <laughs> Men political's fine, you know. So. All right, all right. <laughs> all right. Well, this has been tremendous fun and an honor, Robert. We want to thank you. Robert Dobby for sharing your stories, <laughs> license to kill, and the right. other parts of your wonderful career. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Robert. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you both. God bless you. All right. This has been Dan Silvestri. And Tom Pizzotto. From SpyMovieNavigator.com and our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Subscribe to our show through your favorite podcast app or through our website. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it. And thanks to Robert Dobby for coming on. What is America to me? A name, a map, or a flag I see. A certain word, democracy. What is America to me? The house I live in A plot of earth, the street The grocer and the butcher And the people that I meet The children in the playground The faces that I see All races and religions That's America to me place I work in, the worker by my side, the little town or village where my people lived and died, the howdy and the handshake, that air of feeling free, and 
the right to speak my mind out. That's America to me. The things I see about me, the big things and the small. That little corner newsstand and a house a mile tall. The wedding and the churchyard, the laughter and the tears, and this dream that's been a growing for about two hundred and fifty years. The place I live in. The street, the house, the room, the pavement of the city, or a garden all in bloom. The church, the school, the clubhouse, the million lights I see, but especially the people. Yes, especially. That's America to me.